Good evening. My name is Chris Eberly. I am president of the Anne Arundel Bird Club. I want to welcome everybody here, uh, members of Anne Arundel, as well as other bird clubs. Uh, we have a, what I think is going to be a, a very um, engaging discussion and uh, presentation tonight. Um, we we uh, are honored to have Dr. Mark Bonta with us as our speaker tonight. Uh, Mark Bonta was raised on a mountaintop in central Pennsylvania and went on to explore the remote corners of the planet through service to the Peace Corps and academic research at several small colleges. Dr. Bonta has traversed more than 40 countries and six continents in his pursuit of global citizenship and has been involved in environmental conservation efforts in the Philippines, Australia, Honduras, Mexico, and the U.S. His many passions include all things related to birds, including the wisdom traditions of avifauna among local and indigenous peoples. Mark is also a leading expert on cycads, if that's how it's pronounced, okay. Uh, living fossils that are the most threatened group of plants in the world. Uh, you can access his publications. I'm gonna post the link for his publications and his eBird profile. Um, and don't get too depressed when you look at that eBird profile. Um, and also I will post on here um, that he and his wife, Dr. Paolo Jaramillo, um, mm -hmm. Uh, lead customized nature and birding trips to Mexico for monarchs, macaws, and other spectacles. And I will put the information in here with his email. If you're interested, uh, please get in touch with him. Uh, so tonight we are very pleased to have you, Dr. Bonta, to give us um, some information on these things called firehawks. I'll turn it over to you, thank you. All right, uh, good evening everybody. I'm um, coming to you from inside my barn on top of that mountaintop where I was raised. Been kind of restricted back here. I, I left, uh, was teaching in China with my wife and we had to come back actually before COVID, but it's been a great year. We have a, a private nature reserve here, so several hundred acres and I've just started to do nocturnal flight calls and some other things. So it's been keeping me busy on our, on our hot spot here. I'm glad you mentioned the birding tours, although those seem to be kind of on the rocks these days with the pandemic, but maybe we can start them again. I was a, someone was talking about swifts and I, I'm really interested in mass bird phenomena and watching how birds interact with each other. And in northeastern Mexico, they have um, sinkholes, giant sinkholes in the ground that uh, in one case, there's a sinkhole with over 2 million of these uh, white colored swifts that come out every day and these spy just absolutely amazing spectacle and uh, go back in at night, uh, swifts and parakeets as well. So I was just thinking about that. Um, I, yeah, I'm a geographer by profession. But uh, so as I re do relationships of people, what people know and how people relate to birds and to plants and so forth is more my area of expertise. So I'm not a trained ornithologist, but I've worked closely with ornithologists. And I've also um, been talking a lot to someone that I think in the context of this talk, I would highly recommend I'm going to write her name down in her two books. And she is really, made headway writing about, uh, her name is Jennifer Ackerman, and she's written two books, The Genius of Birds in 2016 and The Bird Way this year. And she talks to scientists to learn about and write about um, the genius, the intelligence of birds. And really there's a lot to think about in these books. And in the second book, she consulted with uh, Bob Gosford, uh, one of the, the, the Australians that I've collaborated with in the Firehawks research, and it was just an excellent relationship. Um, she, uh, I've talked to a lot of journalists over this idea of, or this, this phenomenon of birds that, uh, that spend time at fires and birds that transport uh, burning sticks. 
But, uh, you know, her work's really also extraordinary, and there's a bit in this latest book of hers about what we learned, or we've learned what people have known for a long time. So there's something in what I'm talking about, about what people know, and also about the genius of birds themselves. The intelligence of birds is absolutely extraordinary. There are YouTube videos now um, with de crows and so forth. You can see some of, you know, there's new research coming out almost every month, just extraordinary things that are we're understanding about bird communication. Um, and things that you can see one, now that we have the tools to kind of know more, to film them and to tape them and so forth, to analyze and have a better idea of what exactly birds are thinking about, how they're planning. Maybe we can learn why some birds are successful like vireos and other birds are declining. Um, it's just incredible amount of work being done. And, uh, but, but if you want a, a quick introduction to it, her stuff is just addictive. Her books are really hard to put down. So I'll put that um, plug in there. Let me um, start my talk up. I, you know, you don't have to go to Australia to see extraordinary uh, things happening with birds. I saw something th the other day that I uh, have never seen before in my life. I mentioned earlier that we have tons of ravens here. Uh, we're on top of a major migratory ridge on, in the Ridge and Valley section, and I saw a raven flying right next to a possibly migratory red-tailed hawk and just gliding right next to it. They weren't fighting. Um, they only touched wings once and they did this for like a minute and the raven was making these strange court of calls and then it just peeled off and the hawk kept going. So some sort of interspecies communication. I mean, if you look closely at some of these birds, you can see some, you know, really extraordinary things. So, you know, Australia is very expensive. I'd love to take a tour there, but it's very expensive to get to or difficult now, but, um, you know, you can see some things if you watch birds very closely. You know, people see these at their feeders as well, film them, and it's giving us a lot really to think about. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, get into firehawks here. You'll also see them referred to as fire kites. Here's the kind of the tag, are they arsonists or are they land managers? And so most of the, the, the promotion or the, the media kind of... Um, craziness that happened a couple of years ago after our article came out. They love to use this term arson. And I, I don't really like the word, you know, like pyromaniac, but uh, they, they, they do seem to be another force for managing the land in a sense. Uh, the, the Australian Aboriginal people that we're going to look at in a little bit of detail later tonight, um, you know, they, they, they have a positive view of these birds, in mythology and in practice. And uh, other people don't, other people would uh, rather, rather shoot them and see them as, you know, fire starters. They are gonna destroy your, you know, your ranch's infrastructure and, and so forth. So uh, different ways of looking at them, but hopefully we try to redeem these birds. It's become a little difficult. If you remember at the beginning of the year, there were all these, uh, there were all these wildfires in Australia and I'll uh, talk a little bit about that. So let's uh, just see what we're looking at here. This is a better video than anything we've been able to take yet, but it's from Western Australia. So I'll just play this first and then a, a typical news clip from Australia after that. So this is, this is the broad term is fire foraging. And I'll be talking more about that than um, the fire spreading, which is a specific type of behavior the tool using behavior, but fire foraging, many species of birds, including raptors all around the world show up at wildfires. Well, they're actually all human caused fires from what I can tell and uh, forage for insects and reptiles and so forth. And so it's a very interesting phenomenon. So here's what it looks like at a grass fire. And I did want to mention, I may lose connectivity once or twice and it'll come back on. I'm not sure what's wrong, but we have a, uh, rural internet here that's less than desirable. Okay, let's uh, put this on full screen. And this is a little video. A lot of things have come out since our work got published in 2017. A lot of short videos and so forth. And this one is done by an Aboriginal Indigenous Australian um, corporation in Western Australia. So 
So this is basically what you see. There's, there's no narration in this video, but these are all black kites. There's probably a couple whistling kites mixed in. Here, there, probably a brown falcon, but the black kites are predominant here. And they're just at all levels. They're getting right in close to the flames. Not really sure how they're able to do this so successfully, but black kites do this uh, fire foraging all over the world where they occur, which is much of the old world. So there's videos from Madagascar and India and so forth. Mark, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, the video. You should be. Hold on, hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Let me share the other, okay. I'm doing it differently than my other talk. Here we go. Now you should okay. be seeing it. Yep, very good, thanks. Try that again. Sorry about that. Okay. So floodplains of a river in Western Australia. So again, in this case, hundreds, in some cases, thousands. The black kite is the primary raptor that shows up at fires and so it's not unexpected that within this type of thing occasionally people would see one you know picking up sticks and engaging in that specific behavior which is what really captured people's attention fire spreading but um, this is fire foraging and they're getting right up in there this is repeated as i was saying all over the world a lot of fire foraging goes on in africa because there's a lot of burning all of this is burning caused by humans to for um, to manage the uh the landscape arid landscapes like this typically burn and are burned on purpose just like we would you know manage prairie reserves and so forth i'll be talking a bit about more about that i'll probably there'll be a lot of questions raised as much as possible after the if you have some questions i can address um we'll get into that and this is the reference to some of the things that, like I said, after we, uh, we published, they don't have any footage of that per se. And it's been devilishly difficult to come across um, good footage of birds spreading fire. So the other video here to start out with is, I'll just go to this one. Getting the sharing correct here. Okay, hold on. Hello everyone, I am asking for no, not that. Thank you. Biological arsonists. And they are, um, I may skip that one because they've inserted several political ads in there and I don't want us to have to watch those right now. So we'll just uh, skip that for the time being. Okay. Let me share my original one, go back to that. Okay, here we go. Okay, Chris, are you seeing the original uh, talk again here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let's skip that. All right, so the part one of this, I'm going to go through some of the science, which is basically, you know, what our research questions are, why we did it, when we did it, and some of what we found out, there's not a huge reveal. Uh, we went in 2018 was our last trip. And so I went several times. Australia is a very expensive country to visit regardless of where you go. And we were going to very remote areas in Northern Territory. So it's like traveling in Alaska by bush plane sort of thing. Well, we didn't have to fly, but very expensive and um, quite the endeavor to coordinate groups from across the world to be able to do this. So we haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time on the ground there, but if you've not been to any part of Australia, many of the birds are entirely different. They are incredibly loud and musical. There's nothing like the Australian magpie. Um, there are encounters with birds you can have in Australia that you'll have nowhere else. Um, Jennifer Ackerman spends a lot of time on Australian birds, and I can see why. They think the evolution of bird song may have occurred there. And since much of the continent is savanna, it's very easy to see the birds. Uh, you, as soon as we get off the plane and started traveling first, uh, south the very first time that we flew into Darwin, in the northern tip of Northern Territory, so North Central Australia, and then just drove south. It was amazing how easy it was to see how birds and how large most of them are. 
But after we get through the science of this, and then we'll look at the landscapes, the birds, and also the Aboriginal culture, which is so important to this knowledge of birds and science of managing birds and managing the landscapes that birds uh, exist in in this country. Um, so the main terms, as I've already mentioned, this fire foraging isn't really well researched, it turns out. So I backed up a bit and I've been looking more at that because the chance I could go out and I just can't spend months in the field trying to find fire spreading happening. But I can look at this broader fire foraging and I found about three to 400 species worldwide of birds, everything from bee eaters to Swainson's hawks in the US to um, you know, in all sorts of raptors, but also flycatchers and so forth. And it turns out in the old days in the US when there were more wildfires, more human set fires and more burning, there were more observations, but no one studied it. Fire was seen as such a terrible thing that very few people thought to actually look at birds around fires. But it turns out, I mean, in terms of migrating raptors, for example, in the Great Plains, it is still very important for things like Swainson's hawks. And here and there, you know, maybe we'd have a better understanding of it, but a lot of food gets generated here. Uh, so within this then fire spreading, and we're saying intentional, and as far as we know so far, Australian raptors of three species, the brown falcon and two species of kites, but also a very good report of a completely different, highly intelligent bird called the fork-tailed drongo of Southern Africa. And I've talked to a fellow that's actually seen this behavior, again, picking up a burning stick, picking, it one up, picking different ones up and dropping it in unburnt patch of vegetation so that more vegetation will burn, so that more food will be flushed. That's the basic tool using behavior that we're talking about. So these two terms. So of course, uh, they make it sound like this is recently discovered. In reality, it was first published in the 1960s, but even there it was an indigenous belief. And much of what we did, we talked to firefighters and we published some publicized some other reports. We went through the data and we said, there's a very good case for this being real. Well, Australians have known about this for 40,000 years. The world's oldest cultures are in Northern Territory. And this is extremely important to them. So it was a vindication of what they knew. So it got picked up first before our article, some blogs of uh, Bob Gosford, uh, Birds Carrying Flames, and then we had uh, some articles then after came out in National Geographic and a lot of other major media. So the arson term, and we got picked up in the Washington Post and the New York Times, and particularly the New York Times that, that you know, lent, lent a lot of credibility there. And it was very interesting kind of, I've spent years and years and years toiling in obscurity and things that took a lot more work. This frankly did not take an enormous amount of work to do this research, and it, but it became a hundred times more popular than every, anything I'll probably ever do or have done. So people are fascinated by birds being intelligent. And there's this thing about fire, Humans, you know, are like, you know, the Prometheus myth and so forth that, you know, humans are seen as, you know, man is the only animal intelligent enough to control fire and so forth. And, you know, so we had to keep telling the journalists, you know, the birds aren't starting the fires, they're spreading the fires. They don't sit around with the fire sticks, you know, they're not rubbing two sticks together. They're not that smart, but this is the evidence. And uh, we had Australian ornithologists that have doubted this before that said, you know, your interviews, the evidence you have, and, you know, this has convinced us that this isn't accidental. This is a real thing. And so this year, then, the, um, the, the other video I'd hope to show you is basically an Australian news report that was trying to blame the birds, you know, that the native Australian bird is making the bushfire crisis worse these people contacted me like typical media. They, they want, you know, they, they have an article that's due at midnight and they have to talk to you and, you know, you can't write them an email and it's all the, all what's convenient to them. And it's a tabloid, but they were going to publish it anyway. So I tried to say, well, you know, I don't really think this is a big factor because the bushfires in any case are in Southern Australia. Northern Australia has got a different fire regime. And I, I, you know, I really, I don't think that this is something you want to be blaming the birds on. It's not a behavior, the birds aren't there setting fires everywhere you look. It's a, a rare 
behavior. But um, in any case, you never know where this will pop up. So who are we? Uh, I'm the geographer and the ethnoornithology. So this is an old term, but there's a lot of it happening now. And this is the study of what people know about birds. People know, indigenous people know enormous amounts about birds and a knowledge that ornithologists may not know. And when an ornithologist works together with an ethnoornithologist, they can uh, really do a lot for conservation and learn a lot of new things. So this is what Bob and I have been doing. And he's also a highly respected land rights lawyer. So if you're wondering, you know, how we are able to get into some of these areas are off limits and so forth. And, and he's uh, worked directly with these Aboriginal corporations that own these areas of land. So it was very nice to have that portal into these, these amazing cultures. I never otherwise would have been impossible working directly with them with their permission with the traditional owners. Fire Chief Nathan Ferguson, an Aboriginal corporation and numerous other people and some Pennsylvania birders on our last trip to get more video documentation and just more images and so forth. This is Nathan, the fire chief here, and he has seen the behavior on like 10 or 12 occasions, I think. He's spent a lot of time around fires in Northern Australia, Bob, to the right. Um, so folks from one of the uh, Aboriginal corporations that we first visited. So these ranger corporations, these guys um, are out there tasked with starting wildfires, uh, managing the landscape with fire to try to prevent the big fires later on in the year, restoring a lot of restoration ecology hand in hand with the Australian government managing sacred sites. So it's very exciting. There are also brigades of Australian women, uh, Aboriginal women as well, highly significant and it's working really well. They work directly with a lot of scientists. And we worked with these, this ranger group particularly has helicopters and all sorts of things. They're very well equipped and they manage territories as large as the state of Pennsylvania in some cases. So the where, where did we carry out our research? We were basically up here in the middle of Northern Territory. Keep in mind, this is as large as the continental United States. And all of the time, the research is only in Northern Territory, but we have plenty of reports from across Northern Tropical Australia, because everything's upside down there. And um, a few from farther South. And that's the fire, fire spreading. So this is tropical savanna here, integrating into kind of a subtropical savanna, sort of like the way uh, Southern Florida used to be, South Texas, Northern Mexico, and um, some deserts in here as well. And then tropical forests and mangroves right along the very top there. But this is called the, uh, the top end of Australia. And, um, we have many fire spreading records now. We published about 18 at the time. We have tons more. So it, this was originally around 2010. Bob and I were at a conference in Venezuela and, and he just casually mentioned that he had heard of this. And I said, this is extraordinary because this is such an important tool use. Tool use, tool use. We're talking the landscape with fire. And this is something that we've always said is basically either lightning strikes, but you know, much of what we see out there was caused by humans. Humans have been definitely the arsonists for thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even over a hundred thousand years. We've been burning, we've been burning for lots of different purposes, hurting, uh, creating green, green, uh, you know, new growth, um, burning, you know, burning for if when we've had cattle and so forth and, and all the, all the rest of the reasons that we burn. And now we have this other force here. So he blogged about it and then we uh, got global publicity in, up in 2018. So where it all started, there was a lot of negative publicity and I'll talk a little bit about this. Australian Aboriginal people had their land taken away starting in 1788, lost the entire continent and now they're getting it back. So um, they, 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 uh, there's been a progressive kind of rediscovery of the value of Australian culture and the complexity of Australian Aboriginal people. And this was an account of someone who lived more traditionally. And in this book, Wai Puldanya, there was also a documentary film done with it. He, he is quoted as saying, because it's a ghost written book, that uh, 
they're deliberately setting fire to grass and bushland to assist their scavenging. So this was published in 1962. That's almost uh, 60 years ago, but it was largely ignored, i.e. no one really went in and tried to document this behavior. It was just kind of a curious thing that Aboriginal people know about. And he speculates it's possible that our forefathers learned this trick from the birds. So this is one of these things that I have a colleague, Rob Fergus, down around Philadelphia that studies a lot of this. What did human beings learn in evolutionary time from other animals? Because, of course, we co-evolved with numerous species in Africa and so forth. And I, I didn't speculate much about this, but it's interesting to think. I said, well, maybe birds might have learned this behavior from looking at humans too. It's not necessary that we learn from them or they learn from us, but getting into the mindset of the way these people who have lived until recently as they had lived for tens of thousands of years, very close communication with nature and knowledge of it. This was many, one of the many things that he uh, wrote about. So what we wanted to do was basically follow up on that 1962 publication, find, you know, he publicized in local newspapers, Bob did, you know, if you have a report, let us know. He would interview the people, he would get rid of the ones that really didn't seem viable. He would go and sit down and, you know, he's a very experienced um, lawyer. He does, puts together um, briefs, interviews people. And so he was using that same kind of, you know, I sit down and interview and, and um, trying to figure out, you know, what evidence is credible and how is this related to religious beliefs? Is this just something people are, you know, confusing with religion? I mean, that wouldn't be unusual. This was typically what was assumed that they're confusing this. If we could find out anything about intentional fire spreading, we were hopefully trying to do. We never really set out to see intentional fire spreading because we didn't have the time and you had, luck seems to be a big part of it and you have to spend much of your career out fighting fires. But at least we eventually got up close to fires to see how the fires work and you know the birds you know interact with the fires. It, how this relates to how the land is managed and you know these broader questions of humans that use you know, humans using fire that I just mentioned and where savannas come from. So what did we find out? I'll, I'll go back to this at the end so that none of this is really a mystery. It's not a common behavior, it's uncommon. And it, it took a lot of time to figure out, you know, the reason that people don't just see this casually is, is you know, people don't spend time right next to fires. It's not really very safe. And most people don't go running up to bushfires. Uh, they're often hard to get to unless you're starting them yourselves and hanging around. So the people with repeated experience of bushfires were the ones that typically had seen this. But even when you're seeing it, you're not quite sure you're seeing it. So you have to eliminate the reports where they might have picked it up by accident. Aboriginal people in every group surveyed, so we're talking about dozens of language groups across Northern Australia. Every group knows about this and know that it's not religion. The Aboriginal people now live in the modern world as well and know all about science and so forth. And you know, say, okay, yes, it's in our religion, but no, this is something that also happens and this is when they do it and why. The general public are enthralled about that, like I said, and I mentioned that, you know, we really didn't know much about fire foraging and going forward, hopefully there will be more research and more interest in the broader importance of birds that go to fires. So this is the article, Intentional Fire Spreading, and um, we mentioned the term indigenous ecological knowledge, and this is a lot of what we talked about Let's see if there's anything else here. No, I mean, it's just, if you're interested in the article, I can send you by specific request. I'm not really supposed to because it's a behind a paywall, but there are also the, the good stuff in here, while it had the map, all of the different sightings and you know documentations that people had given us that seemed valuable, is that we didn't just summarize it. We published as good, a lot of good science will do today. You'll put all of your data in there as well. Um, some of these people were protected and we changed their names. Other people, it was okay. And these are old firefighters. This guy is particularly crusty old firefighters. Um, they have another term for them down here, as you can see. They don't like them because they know these damn birds are going to show up. So if you're fighting a fire and then you go home, you go back to the pub, you're drinking some beers and your boss says, hey, look, that fire is still spreading. So you guys, you know, you're not going to get paid or whatever. You have to go out. You need to stop this fire. So damn it, you know, we, we stopped that fire. 
and there's a tendency to kind of say, well, the hawks were hanging around. They actually come out into the nighttime, we saw. They'll, they'll hunt by the, the, the light of the flames if they're hungry enough. And well, that, fl that fire was burning out, and so the hawks decided to spread it. The kites and the falcons decided to spread it. And this was this big belief that they have because they're very experienced firefighters. They know how to put out a fire. And it can be a life or death situation for stock or perhaps for somebody's ranch. So they were, you know, glad that we were able to publish this because we've indicated this kind of, you know, what the government and so forth, land managers just said, well, this is just a folk belief. You guys are just not very good at, at controlling fires, whether you started them and then you put them out or whether they were wildfires that you had to put out. So, um, but we have all these reports in there as well in the supplementary material so people could read through and kind of make their own, you know, judgments, you know. So, that's where it stands. Now, I've crossed out the word outback here because that's kind of like a touristy term. Australia does a very good job branding itself for tourism to bring in people from the rest of the planet. An extraordinary job, actually. And, um, but you don't call it out back there. You call it the bush like you would in Africa or whatever. You go out into the bush and the bush doesn't have any infrastructure. There's no cell towers or anything. There's maybe a paved road. Uh, during the rainy season, you have to fly to a lot of places. It's just vast areas of um, scrub and desert and um, very few people somewhat like the stereotypes if you've seen some movies about the Australian bush. I'll show you a few photos. So, so Northern Territory is a gigantic expanse of land. It's administered directly or pretty much directly from the uh, central government in Canberra. And so they've been able to do things that they haven't been able to do in some of the states in terms of um, indigenous rights and land management. And they've implemented these um, these land management techniques that we'll talk about. Landscapes, if you go to Australia hoping to see towering mountains, there's not a lot of that. There are a few areas, particularly in the bush and up in Northern Territory. This is about as good as it gets. And that's about as the most water you'll see unless you go all the way up to Darwin, which is very lush and tropical. So this is outside of Alice Springs in 2017. A lot of acacias and a lot of eucalyptus trees, as you might imagine. Uh, no koala bears out here, though. A lot of emus, though. One of Earth's oldest landscapes to fly over. It's extraordinary. You know, you can really see the backbones of the ranges and so forth. The dead heart of Australia, as they call it. You might drive six hours to get to a town of 300 people. If you've ever been to northern Canada, the Yukon, or been to Alaska, it's just sort of like a, a tropical version of that. So... Uh, if you don't like a lot of people, um, you go to Australia and there's a town of 25,000 in the middle of it called Alice Springs. Imagine the entire United States with just one town of about that size and a few villages. Everything else is more or less around the edges, Sydney and Melbourne and so forth, Perth. And that's because there's very little rainfall and it's not predictable rainfall. So a lot of the rainfalls localized and the birds move around nomadically in these, a lot of nomadic groups of birds, the honey eaters and so forth and uh, as do a lot of the mammals, as did people originally. These are the termite mounds that you see, enormous numbers of them, uh, very important. A lot during the fires they burn and then the birds sit on top of the termite mounds and dive down into the fires. People sometimes put shirts on them. Australians have very whimsical senses of humor. Uh, can, if you don't know, know it, you expect some very interesting practical jokes. Uh, very, very fascinating. These are the kinds of signs that you see. So you have to go prepared. And it really did remind me of Alaska, a place that I've really loved as well. Uh, it looks can be deceiving. A lot of this is the bush is underwater in the wet in the rainy season. I've not been there during the rainy season. Um, wasn't really feasible to go anywhere. Very difficult to get around and prohibitively expensive to fly to these different places. So these tropical savannas, around the first area that we did research, you'll see a little bit about later on, and uh, nice little hills and uh, yeah, very open, like I said, so any birds that are here, we'll see a look at some of the fire associated birds later on. This isn't really a talk on Australian birds, although I do have, I guess I have a talk like that as well, because 
Um, I did do a lot of, we also just did a lot of birding as well. We tried to get as good a list as possible for, for Northern Territory, it's sparsely birded. Um, a billabong, what we would call an oxbow lake maybe in the south, the cutoff part of a river in the uh, northern part of Northern Territory where you still have these. Um, and just like in the movies, if you ever watch Crocodile Dundee, you don't get near these things if they have estuarine crocodiles in them. They have fresh water as well, but they have these saltwater crocodiles that are absolutely terrifying, and they come in running up on land and grab people and dogs. And so I, I was chastised by Bob for putting my toe in the water when we were driving across a river one time at the, on the bank of it. So they're a very real hazard, and a lot of things are there in Northern Australia really amazing, far more than Latin America. And it's something about Australia, just there's a um, water buffalo that are very docile from Southeast Asia. They introduced them to tropical Australia and they're now the most dangerous thing out there. We saw them several times, very unpredictable. So uh, something about the Australian landscape that uh, does this, I guess. And of course, all of the fun snakes and so forth. So looking a little more closely, what we're interested in here, you can see this landscape, uh, prominent fire scars on these gum trees and nice, uh, the understory is very sparse and that's what you wanna see. You do not wanna see what you would have seen a lot more of 30 or 40 years ago, um, very little burning taking place and just um, this would get you know drier and drier and drier. The grass would get very high and then it would burn. You'd have these massive burns and it would destroy many species of birds were at the brink of extinction. Um, and so they have done a lot of fire management to try to do more burning. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but the more burning you do on a yearly basis um, and you get these fire scars built up, but mostly you burn out the grass, you'll reduce the risk of something that will toast out the entire landscape. So the fires in Southern Australia have been a result in areas where there are a lot of people and a result of more fire suppression because when you add in global climate change, then you know it's a recipe for disaster. You know, who, I'm not gonna compare it with what's happening in the US, but I did look a lot at what's happening in Australia. And Northern Australia has been, particularly Northern Territory, they have dumped many hundreds of millions of dollars into this restoration ecology. They say getting it back to the way it was in 1788, and it was open park-like landscapes and, and getting away from this, you know, uh, just suppression of fires. This landscape has to burn. It's been burnt since people have been here and that's a very long time. Whether it was burnt as much before that is hard to know. So as this grass is growing up after a, a strong wet season, then what they're gonna have to go in and burn this out. And so they will go in and burn. And, uh, there's different ways of doing it as you'll see. You'll see these kinds of things. Now, cattle stations, this is not sheep territory. The only thing that can really grow out here on these ranges are cattle and these range upward of a million acres for a single holding, which may be owned by Aboriginal people or by uh, non-Aboriginal uh, white uh, cattle ranchers. So just massive areas. And so this is the concern they have for the firehawks is that they can't really stop that kind of thing. And a lot of these fires just burn out. It's a lot of smoke. It's not a huge fire. There were birds all through here, but you can't really see it. Just a typical one you would see um, as you drive along the highway. If you are lucky enough to get up close, which isn't easy, in this case, a fire is, um, is right next to a road in Queensland. One of our co-authors had took this photo. These are all uh, black kites here. And they're nice, they're big birds. They're this, almost the size of red tails. Um, let's see if uh, I get a little bit of a sound on these. So these were as close as they would come. They follow you around. They're also known to fish using lures and various other behavior. They'll scavenge for garbage. They're, um, they have various cooperative behavior. They the family groups, I guess. And they're around a lot of the towns. And if they see a fire, they just head out of town. The less fires there are, the farther they'll go. And you could see their range here all over the world. And they've actually, a few of them have been picked up in the West Indies, so who knows if eventually they'll colonize here, but um, they're extremely gregarious and they're flocks of thousands. So they do migrate. Some of the birds that come in Northern Australia are migratory. And when I lived in China up here, I saw black kites migrating up here toward the top of their range. Let's see if I can get the uh, volume here.
So highly significant birds. And, you know, people like them a lot. I mean, they like the experience of them. Australia is a great country to see raptors. There are also wedge-tailed eagles are quite common, and a lot of other raptors are, are, you know, the reason they're seen so much at fires is because there are so darn many of them. Then there are several species that are threatened, and this is what's worried me is the non-discriminate, indiscriminate shooting of raptors, which is as illegal in Australia as it is here, by the way. There's no, no allowance for killing, for anybody really killing that, that, that you know, raptors. But, um, also makes it easy to uh, to see them in the savanna. So this other bird that also goes to fires and is documented as a fire spreading bird as well is the whistling kite. As you can see, limited to Australia and New Guinea and uh, really extraordinary sound it makes here. Yeah, so aptly named whistling kite, Haliaster spinurus, a different genus. And you can, I didn't think, you know, going in, I, 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 first of all, when, when 2018, we finally, you know, after a couple of years, they said, look, we'll light some fires for you. You come and watch the birds. I thought these are going to be super hard to, you know, to, 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 um, to get close to fires. It's going to be dangerous. And I won't be able to ID the birds. But it wasn't that hard to pick this species out because there's maybe 10% as many or less. So they're not an uncommon bird, but nothing compared to the black kites. And there were several other species of, of raptors diving in and out of the smoke or hunting, you know, brown goshawk, um, wedge-tailed eagle, and so forth. So it wasn't just those, those three. Since they're the most common, they're the ones that have been documented doing the fire spreading, but it could be that, you know, some of other raptors do it as well. It seems to be in the area. Um, we, we had some indications of other species. It's just that the people that had documented the knowledge were anthropologists and had really no knowledge of birds. And so some of the indigenous uh, accounts, you couldn't really get it to species. Um, but at least this is, and this is the third one. This is the most iconic fire spreading bird. This is the brown falcon, the carcanj. Again, that same range all over the place. We drove down the main paved highway through central Australia, or actually north from Alice Springs, and I was counting them. And every kilometer, they were, I mean, they, in some cases, just every few hundred meters, there were one or two. This is a lighter phase. There's a, there's a darker phase as well that's almost black. And there are other species of rare falcon, the black falcon, the gray falcon. So you have to look at e every single falcon. There were hundreds, if not thousands of these. My eBird uh, list is just a string of these little reports north. And they're very intelligent birds and they hang out in pairs and they hunt at fires. And so they're the ones that are associated with the origin of fire in Aboriginal culture. And probably were this, you know, a lot of the original reports, they're not as common as black kite, but they're, they're much more uh, and they're, you know, they're falco like a lot, like our falcons as well, the same genus, a lot of the same habits. Everybody gets tired of them. Maybe they're, they're bigger than, I'm not sure the exact measurements, they're definitely bigger than a kestrel, but they're not, you know, the size of a peregrine or anything like that. They're also very close to human beings and they'll come right into your campsite or right through your campsite. And they're not shy at all. All right, so I'm going to look a little bit at the fire forging. And then after this, the last part of the talks, I'll actually show you some of the other birds. Um, but uh, so in 2018, after going and doing interviews and getting a look at the landscape and so forth, and uh, the years before that, they, these guys were like, you know, you come back and we'll, we will set some fires that we need to burn, some areas that need to be burned. And you come and we'll show you where to stand and where to walk and you can, you can, you know, you can watch the birds do their thing and who knows you might get lucky but I would always said to people, you know, don't go to Australia thinking you're going to find fire um, spreading but if you do, you know, that video is probably worth a lot of money because there is as yet no good video, nothing that you could really say or a photo that that's what they're definitely doing. Um, 
supposedly there are videos that exist, but I've not seen them. So uh, this is the ignition point of this fire. So this Tennant Creek area, we went there first because we also scheduled an Aboriginal burn, but in a lot of cases, those time, times can change radically. Uh, things can happen in Aboriginal culture. And um, like the, we, we set up a workshop one year and it just got um, postponed by about three months and I wasn't able to go because someone had died. And I, I don't know, there was a lot of things that go on. So you can't set the calendar as well, but we did do it. This is a group, a non-Aboriginal group of firefighters who, you know, Nathan manages an area the size of Pennsylvania on a very limited budget. They took about 10,000 Australian dollars and they burned a block of a few kilometers. They started in the afternoon, they wrapped it up in the evening. They just started it from one corner, burned across and then back burned it. Just a typical area of Savannah. And it was, you know, it was not east of this town, this major town of 300 people. So they have to protect the town. They have to burn these areas out. They have a terrible budget really, but they do what they can with the resources they have. And um, these are all volunteers that went out there. So it actually turned out to be very easy. We just walked along the perimeter roads and never had any threat of fire. Um, the fire burns in the way they want it to do. And as long as you're in an area that's along a road or walking in an area that's already been burned, you're fine. So it was actually extremely easy to do research on these types of fires, it, you know, and um, these groups are all interested, very interested in publicizing this very, we had already published the article at this point, we were very happy that, um, that uh, they were very happy to, to have us there. We didn't have any incidents. Um, and uh, so let me see, I will switch over to this as a little video. Now, you know what, I'm going to, mm -mm. what's the difference it's between fire foraging and those starting the Uh-oh. Let me reset this here. Um, let me try to share this other one very quickly. Uh, okay. All right. Okay, here you should be able to see some interesting issues with my internet. So this is a video we took. Some of the many other raw images here. And here they are. So there are also a lot of crows. These are little crows, I think, that were flying around. That's what's making that clawing sound. And we're standing right at the edge of these things, just watching them uh, swoop around. We were trying to yeah, you see that? So there's all sorts of kleptoparasitism there. They, they, we've got video of them grabbing each other's prey and stuff like that. They spend a lot of time doing this. Uh, they seem to do as much time um, bothering each other as actually getting what's in the air, which is grasshoppers, or going on the ground and grabbing what's down there. That, uh, this one here is a whistling kite. Most of these are black kites here. A kite is eating a grasshopper uh, in the air. Okay. Let's go back to the other one again. So, a huge amount of this. Um, what, let me. Uh, get back on my talk here. Okay. Um,
All right. So, yeah, we uh, we documented, uh, like I said, the first time that they had known that birds hunt at fires at night uh, at this fire. We came back the next day and the kites came right over to us, like about 40 or 50, perhaps thinking we were going to light more for them. But we walked around the um, the ashes and birds were everywhere fighting over the remains of reptiles of all sizes. There's some pretty big lizards in Australia and just a, just a real buffet of charred meat for them. So um, they'll go after the grasshoppers in the air and they'll go after the, uh, the mostly the reptiles and, uh, and, and so forth on the ground. There are other birds that show up that I'll show them to you a little later. So after we did that, we were satisfied. We got lots of raw video as expected. We didn't get to see anything that looked like fire spreading. But um, so for the second fire, we were privileged to be able to get him up into Aboriginal territory to the north. Um, typically off limits, but we went with this very well equipped ranger group. So I want to just talk a little bit about Aboriginal culture because, you know, we shouldn't be taking really any credit. We didn't discover anything. We have hopefully respectfully publicized the kinds of things that are important to them and um, the, the visions that come out of their culture uh, can teach humans a lot of things. These are the oldest cultures in the world. And I think in many ways, because they never had to develop agriculture, they're the way we evolved as a species uh, for, from, you know, from the beginning, uh, from our earliest origins up until 10,000 years ago. So in the scan span of millions of years, you know, up until agriculture started a lot of human evolution pre-human evolution is evolution with other species not having agriculture not having herding anything like that and here you have a retention among people that are were misperceived as primitive and are just the opposite they are traditionally extremely well adapted to the environment which would make a lot of sense uh, they didn't plow it they didn't do anything like that and they came to australia and never developed agriculture. And like I said, hit the nadir when Europeans came, uh, they were enslaved, they were hunted down, uh, many went extinct, they lost their culture, now they're fighting to come back and they have many, many problems, but they retain a lot of this culture, particularly where we were. And they speak uh, three, four, five languages each, none of which Westerners can basically learn. They're very complex and difficult. Um, they also speak English, of course, and are full, you know, Australian citizens, but they live in this world. They have to navigate the world of white people, European Australia, so to speak, and also their own worlds and how their land is managed. I said they never had to develop agriculture. They practice fire stick farming. You can't really do agriculture very well in that arid environment, but they would set fire to the land and that would bring the fresh grass for the kangaroos and the emus um, and many other species and you'd have, they'd harvest all sorts of wild foods. It was an extraordinarily complex. And so they were able to live off the landscape often in quite large numbers. Um, they're uh, far fewer now than, than there used to be in a lot of these areas. Their religion has no gods. Uh, so gods seem to be something that came along with domestication and so forth, maybe 10,000 years ago. And so they, they have ancestors. Uh, they, the landscape is a series of dreaming tracks that, uh, that are imprints of the ancestors and what they did. And they regard themselves as part of the environment and cousins to animals with whom they communicate. And their kinship relationships with other people and with the environment are again, ridiculously complex. But they did tell us in no uncertain terms, you know, if you're going to work with us, you know, we don't regard ourselves as masters of the environment or better than the environment. We, you know, we are part of it. So it's not some Hollywood sort of thing about, you know, people close to nature. It's, it's the real thing. And it's so it's interesting to see them getting back to the land. And you also see these dreaming sites, uh, some off limits, some with tourist sites, uh, Westerners or white people are much more interested in this now. And so they, they, they show you these things, you know, what this, uh, what these places are and people go there, they have spiritual significance. Uh, here's another one, a sacred meeting place of the ancestors. So the whole landscape looks different to them. If you're interested in this, you can read the song lines or other books and maybe a few movies to give you an idea of what Australian Aboriginals are experiencing, what they're hearing when they hear birds, you know, how they relate to all this, what they're, what they're thinking to a certain extent. 
Um, so these ranger groups then popped up a few years ago as how are we going to restore these areas? Let's you know work with Aboriginal people and supply money and expertise in terms of technology infrastructure. They're very happy to get out there and um, do all sorts of things. And fire management is part of the thing. So you know, so a lot of them have seen birds at fires, and some of them have seen birds um, spreading fire and moving these these sticks and spreading it on purpose. Like I said, they were perfect people to collaborate with. And um, so they took us out there to this remote area that took us an unbelievable amount of time to get to. And we spent several days and they, they took uh, the elders, they took the traditional owners, the people that quote unquote own the land, or the, the rights to the knowledge about the land. And they also took some youngsters there who uh, are threatened by drugs and other types of things. and urban culture and they took them out into there to experience so they're losing a lot of culture despite what I said uh, the lure of western culture is is uh, very irresistible the lure of alcohol has been very dangerous and so the, taking them out there and teaching them showing them their sacred sites and showing them how to manage fire and then having the elders talk to the teenagers and learning all of these different things it, this is the kind of things that I'm also interested in helping people preserve traditional ecological knowledge before it's lost. This is something that needs to be recorded all over the world um, in the United States and everywhere else that, you know, people know these old traditions. Some of them are, are very valuable. So they came in, we went into this remote area. This was after the other burn and we came up here and they just happily took out their um, uh, fire blowing spreading devices and they just burned out the whole campsite to get rid of all the snakes, they said. And then we waited for the ashes to cool off, which happened quickly. And uh, we pitched our tents and we made our dinner and then we stayed there for a few days. And they uh, had a happy time doing different burns. And we, uh, our team, there was one, two, three, four, five, six of us, um, doing, you know, documenting birds from different angles, trying to figure out more about fire foraging. So much of this, or most of it, we've not published in any form. Um, birds in Australia don't uh, flee from fires. They go towards fires, and they'll go to fires, what are the hot ash phase going toward, toward the cool ash phase, and they will sometimes eat the ash itself. A lot of times they're just going after the insects here. And so people have the tradition of just taking burning brands along as they've done for thousands of years and just lighting things on fire randomly. That's the Aboriginal way of doing it. They don't you know, set off a rectangle and burn it in a scientific fashion. They're just, in a lot of cases, just gonna drop out a fire stick and just burn it and it'll just get patchy burned and then the birds will come in immediately. And so this is a type of parrot Australia's parrots are fabulous. If you like these types of birds, they're everywhere and easy to see a lot of them, all different sizes. So this fire foraging guild, now none of these birds are doing the fire spreading, but uh, they're all showing up. And there are 20, 30 species we documented. Uh, the willy wagtail here, these are what are called wood swallows and we don't have any of them in the new world it's a it's a family from southeast asia and australia they act just like swallows and a lot of the birds that come to these fires and eat insects are the swallows and the swifts and the wood swallows birds that are comfortable in the air birds that can hawk insects this is a bee eater very common at fires pigeons will come in at well, as well a great source of uh, nutrition this is a Australian bustard, one of Australia's larger birds, land birds, other than the emu. And they show up uh, at fires the next day. They come flying in and they're on the hot ash, walking around in groups again, picking out the, uh, the, the dead stuff and so forth. And here's a little bird, um, one of these ubiquitous, one of the few really tiny species there, a partilote. We characterize this as the most common sound of the Australian bush. Just a tiny little bird about this, a little bit bigger than a kinglet. They didn't really forage at fires or, you know, go directly to fires, but they weren't really scared of them. They were just kind of fires were there and they just didn't seem to be bothered. And I spend a lot of time in Latin America and other places and you just don't see that kind of behavior around fires. So it does seem that the birds, you know, have some very, you know, deep connection to you know, being used to this and, and really seeing it as a source of food. Zebra finches come to fires, uh, magpie larks, ring-necked parakeets, another common in, in some areas, a fascinating species. It's a magpie lark. 
remember the family, but it's one that we don't have in the new world either. And a lot of other cool stuff. So um, getting toward the end of this here, so we'll have some time, yeah, about an hour. So I have a little time for questions. So one of the things that makes it very difficult and why we didn't set out to kind of, you know, look directly for fire spreading. We tried to document this and you see this a lot and this is maybe not spreading a fire but it's when these hawks or these in this case kites these um, black kites dive down into the fire they're just grabbing stuff and getting out you know and then they're moving very quickly so they're often picking up a lot of stuff with it. Um, and so the theory sort of that some of the that people had before was, well, you know, Aboriginal people, they just think this is happening and firefighters think it's happening, but really what they're doing is it's by accident and then they kind of realize it's hot and so they drop it somewhere else and so it catches the field on fire and they're not doing any of it on purpose. So, but, and, and so a lot of people have asked me, well, you know, I mean, how smart really are these birds? And, you know, are they really doing it on purpose? A lot of journalists, I said, well, you know, everything a bird does really is on purpose. Uh, you know, it gets up and it, it goes to hunt in certain areas. It thinks, you know, where it's going to go, what kind of prey, it sizes up the prey. I mean, it's not a machine, it's doing this in a certain way. So of course it's also doing this accidental picking up of grass and so forth. It's not that this isn't happening. So this is why we use the word intentional. All of our interviews and what we published were people that are sure they had seen the birds, you know, in one case in groups, moving up a gully, you know, picking up sticks on purpose and dropping them on the other side of a fence, moving sticks across a river when there's a barrier, when the fire's about to burn out. Those are the things that hopefully someday somebody will have the time and the, uh, the funding, the time and the, uh, you know, to be able to, to be able to study more. I'll have a little bit to say about that. It could be studied if we had an enterprising uh, person and we'd hope to do this ourselves. Uh, maybe we still can. They had uh, one of the Aboriginal uh, experts, uh, an elderly woman who was renowned as one of the great uh, um, wise people in this one area. She was talking about the common habit of uh, having to cover over cooking fires. This is a, a, a little crow actually, but um, the brown falcons I mentioned, the ones that are really associated with spreading fire, when there's no fire in the landscape and they're getting hungry and they want a fire to happen, they'll see someone that has a cooking fire and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll fly through camp, grab an ember, grab a stick or whatever and drop it in a field. And so that people had to cover over cooking fires. And she was relatively certain that could be somewhat of a controlled experiment. You could set a bunch of cooking fires, but you'd have to do it during a time when there were no fires, i.e. probably the wet season or something like that. And um, so we didn't publish that, but we've talked about it a lot. So not just wildfires, you could have a fire spread from your own cooking fire. So we, this is the, what the Australian Aboriginal people call the, the troublemaker for fire. Again, the, the brown falcon. And um, at the origin of time and the stories that are, in, that are acted out occasionally through these multi-day dramas about the origin of the, of everything. So the Karkanj, the brown falcon, was the one that brought fire to humanity or brought fire to all, all other species. And so they do a dance. Um, they acted, and this was reported on long before the, the accounts of this being a real thing. It was reported on in the myths of groups here that they would perform this fire hawk dance. And I, I met a person that was, his totem was this bird. So he, in a sense, his alter ego was the brown falcon. And he introduced me as, he said, you know, I am the bird that you're studying. It was the way that he translated it into English. So a very close kinship with birds, which I don't think you'd find in, in many other cases. But uh, what is the, the truth of all this? Um, Aboriginal people are very familiar with science at this point, Western science. They know how it's done and they know how to uh, separate um, fact from fiction, so to speak, or that let's say mythology and so forth or origin stories from what people are seeing. And 
they're definitely seeing it, but we put the evidence out there for people to look at themselves because this was the key. The last thing I'm going to talk about, we we're only going to learn meaningful things about intentional fire spreading, what everybody's interested in through long-term behavioral studies. You know, people said, well, all this, stuff, how come no one's taken a video? Well, most videos not been taken of most bird tool uses, except under controlled conditions. If you get on YouTube, you're going to see a lot of crows picking up a lot of sticks in laboratories or whatever. In the wild, people don't tend to hang around bird groups as much, uh, but they should hang around black kites for a few months or a few years. So that's why I said we need a Diane Foss here, a Jane Goodall. I mean, we, we didn't know a lot about chimpanzees or gorillas, you know until these uh, zoologists went out there and actually lived close or with the great apes. And I think it would be feasible for black kites. They're very gregarious. They're not afraid of human beings. They hang out in pretty good big groups. All reports are that in any group of hundreds of birds, you might have just a few that are spreading fire. There's a knowledge component. And they only seem to be spreading fire when fires are scarce. None of the times we were there, what we found out is ironically, we would have had to go October onward during the wet, go to a time when birds are hungry and there's no fire, set a fire and see what happens because they can't set fires themselves. But um, you know whether they'd learned this from human beings or from had been spreading it from lightning, whether it happens on other continents, you know, we do have an indication of a completely different species doing this. All are questions that could occupy um, intrepid field biologists or anthropologists or geographers or anyone with a pair of binoculars who would like to go into the Australian bush. I always say, if you know someone that would like to go out, we can uh, connect you with one of these fire ranger teams. They do spend a lot of time out in the bush and you could, uh, you know, eat bush meat, you know, kangaroo tail and that sort of thing. A lot of times they just go out to their countries. You know, most people are living in towns now, but they'll go out to these areas for a long amount of time just to kind of get back and, and commune with uh, nature, so to speak, and the ancestors. And maybe, you know, find some kites, tag along at enough fires with some good video equipment. But even there, you, you'd really have to, you know, casual sightings aren't going to do much more than what we've done, which is establish it as something that um, people believe is a real thing going beyond that we just need more time and more patience and so that was one of the, the one of the major takeaways there um right so uh that's all i have uh chris shared my academia earlier that's my yahoo address um any questions if you're interested in seeing the publication or any of the other things that are out there i'd be more than happy to uh share it it says my internet connection is unstable, but I will stop the share. All right, uh, Chris, that's, uh, that's all I have for you guys tonight. So uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, well, thank you. That was, that Am was I still uh, on video. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I'm having, I was having kind of connectivity issues. It didn't, luckily it didn't go too badly. So I wasn't sure there, but yeah, that's what I have. If I'll be happy to take some questions. I know it's getting a little late, but uh, yeah, well, and I just, you know, I'll, I'll start the questions. Um, I, I guess I wasn't aware that species like Swainson's hawks uh, would have this kind of behavior. Yes. And I, I'm curious, is that both on the breeding yes. grounds and in, uh, in the, like the pampas region of South America on the wintering grounds? Good. So, um, so what I was doing actually at one point during the pandemic, uh, I, have compiled a database of every every citation I can get to publications that have talked about this. And there's some folks that were setting fires out in Kansas um, just to kind of establish that hawks hunt at fires. And Swainson's in migration were the overwhelming species. But raptors have been tracked, white-tailed hawks, zone-tailed hawks, Swainson's hawks, red-tailed hawks, all the way from, possibly from Canada, definitely the US, Mexico, Central America, Brazil, um, pretty far south, there are reports of birds at fires. There's other than South Africa, there's almost nothing systematic in Ivory Coast. This study was done a couple of years ago. I can send you the citations on this, or that I can actually send you the the the, um, the Excel sheet and so forth. Um, it's all very scattered. 
these folks, I don't, I'm terrible with remembering people's names, but a couple of biologists out just in the last few years, they're the ones that coined the term pyric carnivory um, for fire, for what I call fire foraging, that they call pyric carnivory. But yeah, and um, also in Florida, there was a forester that documented a lot of birds that came to fires in the burning of the pine forests um, back in the 60s and before at the tall trees, uh, the tall timbers experimental station, yeah. but very scattered and little like little snippets in Wilson Blunt and so forth. So I, I spent a happy month or so going through uh, trying to dig up as many references as I could. And there's very like almost no really good and really no really rigorous uh, modern ecological studies. No, no one's doing this at a research station. Mm. Like I said, just this thing where they were burning fires in Kansas. And all they wanted to do was kind of established that birds came to fire so you know they did and they counted them but uh so yeah it's it's something that we need a lot more research on it's they said it was seemed to be very important for for the hawks and every account that has this kestrels as well very common at fires oh okay anybody have a, a question for for mark you can just unmute yourself and ask or type it either way or type it yeah well, I'll, I'll ask one, another one. Ha, has there ever been, uh, has anyone ever documented one of these raptors uh, getting burned <laughs> while they're carrying, carrying a flame, an ember, something like that? We, no, we have tons of footage of um, them doing things that you would think would literally catch them on fire. And um, we don't have an easy answer for why they seem to be so tolerant. Now they're not picking up the hot part of the ember uh, according to the reports they have, you know, they're, they're, they're picking up the other end of it. They know what's mm -hmm. hot and, and, and what isn't and no account of a bird ever catching fire. And we, all the fires we saw, we, we saw a lot of birds. They seem to be able to stay. Now these aren't these towering massive infernos like mm -hmm. you see out West. I mean, because these are already in areas that have been burned pretty regularly. So the fires, but even where the flames were 15 or 20 feet high and you would see them dive. I don't know how they did it, particularly the brown falcons. So um, they're very, you know, they're, they're, they're very experienced at avoiding it, but that's a good question. I, I can't think of a single report of anybody seeing a bird getting burned or catching fire. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie. Um, do, Debbie. You, do you think, um, for, you know, with all the California wildfires, do you think any birds might try foraging in a, a burned out land? even though they hadn't done it before, would they get like as, would they get that idea that it's possible? I mean, they probably never have eaten burned yeah. food, but. Well, this is an excellent question because I wonder, a lot of the reports are from our tropic, uh, our, our subtropical, our savannas in Florida and Texas, but other areas and, there are more reports from back in the times that there were more fires. In fact, it really wasn't unusual. And I think that it's a, you know, birds would have to know that there's food there and not be afraid of it. Now I've been told, you know, certainly when they were looking at fires in the pine forests in the South and back in the sixties, Co Co what was his name? Kovarchek, I think, uh, Co Co so terrible with names, but the, this fellow that documented this for years, he was very much uh, into the use of controlled fire and he went against the grain at the time. And uh, he um, documented all sorts of birds, including a lot of our flycatchers and so forth. And, and there's an excellent uh, uh, publication there, if anyone's interested, one of the, the most lengthy, you know, it wasn't in depth, but, but I just have to wonder with suppression of fires, you know, being widespread if birds lose the knowledge of even, you know, what to do if there is a fire, because I've seen a lot of areas in Latin America that are recently now being burned and I never once saw a bird go onto them. I only have one report from Honduras and I've seen most of the birds in that country. I spent tons of times there and you just don't, you don't see that. And people are always burning things, 
you know, so that, that also re really, I, I really wondered about that. And yet there are other areas like the Pampa, or I don't know the Pampas of Argentina, but the Cejado in, the, in Brazil, extremely common to have raptors. Raptors actually migrate there to, to eat birds from wildfires. Um, like I said, the caracaras are the, um, the, the caracara species that we have, the crested caracara and most other ones are fire specialists. And you can see fire foraging in South Texas still at, at a fire, at a grass fire. Caracaras will go to that and they're known to do that. But yeah, it's a good question out West. I mean, if anybody's seen this, the problem is, I mean, people don't wanna get close to these fires yeah. and you know, it's incredibly dangerous to do so. so you know, to, to what extent? Yeah, that's another question. I think that more people should should study this as well. Because, you know, it has to do a lot, like I said, with avian intelligence, birds that are able to expand their niches and make use of this. I, I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll mention that I have read at least one of Jennifer there Ackerman's books. Uh, I would highly recommend it to everybody, and I'm interested in getting her newest one because she does such an incredible job researching these things. And yeah, the whole intelligence of birds has has blossomed into so many areas. And I think this this um, pyrocarnivory, pyrocarnivory, uh, I like that term. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that uh, probably needs a lot more study. Any other questions? This is Julia again. Hey, Julia. I, was, hi, I was wondering if um, the uh, pyro pyrocarnivory was associated with uh, breeding pairs, or is this something uh, that they pursue during non-breeding uh, sequences of their life? I mean. Good. Um, so the wet in Australia, the wet season tends to coincide with breeding and there's very little fire going on in the wet, but like I said, the, there are definitely accounts of birds even spreading fire during that time of scarce fires. Most of what we were watching was definitely uh, post or pre. And I've had that question before, and we've never, we've never had you know, do documentation, the birds that we're seeing, and we've had accounts from other people where we're assuming that they're family groups. Um, but as far as, yeah, whether they need this and can supplement it, the, the research is just not advanced enough. And, and I'm kind of amazed, particularly in Australia, they've got this laboratory, they've got tons of, of well-funded universities, and no one's ever sat down to really study this kind of thing, the importance of pirate carnivory in diets but yeah that's a, a completely wide open question and since i went through the literature everywhere else i'm trying to think in south africa i can't think of a single a single case where they tied it directly into breeding but there was just speculation about it that was it thank you mm -hmm. All right, well, I guess we will wrap it up then. Um, Dr. Mark Bonta, thank you so much. This was uh, fascinating beyond belief, <laughs> I think. And uh, yeah, Hey, Chris, um, yeah, send me an email. I'm going to be traveling, Chris, but send me an email. I can send you some of those sources. You guys seem like you're interested in some of this more, uh, you know, some of these other things. Um, yeah. So I could just send you a short list there as well. Uh, I don't know when we'll have time or get around to publishing some of this wider thing, but I just want to inspire other people to think about it, look for it, uh, talk to people and so forth. And yeah. yeah, so I'll be happy to do that. You guys are the most uh, inquisitive group yet about this so far. And I've <laughs> talked to a lot of groups, so that's great. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. We'll appreciate getting those sources. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. And thanks everybody for uh, being here and for your interest. Uh, we will uh, have another meeting next month. Uh, and once again, thank you, Dr. Bonta, for uh, a wonderful yeah. evening. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night.